I started working in 1978 at the Youth Law Center. At that time, the best estimates were that there were 500,000 children a year who were held in an adult jail or adult prison for some period of time. I would go into jails and I would be in the jail cell interviewing a child and I could hear adult inmates. And I think children generally have been treated like little mini adults in the justice system. And I think that there was a, uh, a trend line that acknowledged that, well, wait a second, these are not just mini adults develop developmentally. Uh, young people need to be treated differently. When I started work in uh, juvenile justice, I started seeing places where children were held and I was just shocked. Uh, concrete platforms instead of beds, uh, nothing in their cells, uh, often no trained staff who had any training on adolescent development. The Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act is probably one of the most significant legislative actions taken by the U.S. Congress as it relates to juvenile justice in this country. And the way we approach young people um, prior to the JJDPA, there wasn't really any consistent federal guidance or tracking about um, what that should look like, what it does look like, and how we can move forward to better support young people and families and communities. So the JJDPA was monumental 50 years ago in terms of starting to create that national federal frame for how do we protect young people and how do we focus on preventing delinquency and justice involvement. The item I, I want people to understand about the act is that it, it moved us towards a common understanding of minimum standards that we should have in place across the entire country that protect the interests of young people. So if you look at the individual provisions within the Act, there is one section which really talks about what I would call core protections. And that is to make sure that when young people come in contact with the system, one of the core protections is that they should not be put in adult jails. Having nationally unifying language for how we talk about a challenge can make a difference in how people approach it. So having the JJDPA as that foundational document helps keep people on the same page so that when we're talking about challenges, when we say racial and ethnic disparities, we know what that means state by state. And we have people tracking similar sorts of metrics and sharing similar sorts of information around the country. The second reason that the Juvenile Justice Act was created uh, was that Congress recognized that juvenile justice is largely a local issue. 99.9% .9 of young people who come into contact with the juvenile justice system come because of violations of state laws or local regulations, not federal laws. And so it was important for Congress to help the states and local communities develop their own juvenile delinquency prevention programs uh, and their own uh, alternatives to holding kids in adult jails. There are many things that youth all across the country are all experiencing at the same time, but there's also things that are so unique to their local community uh, that only their community can address. Uh, and so what the JJDPA does uh, is it creates this really great system of localizing both funds, uh, but also administration. Uh, and so through state advisory committees, through funding um, 
and nonprofit organizations uh, through the accountability happening at the state level. Um, we're really putting uh, the people on the front line that really understand their community and their local context uh, in a place of responsibility to administer that to the children of their communities. What I think is a direct through line through the, the JJDPA uh, is seeing uh, the applicants that are asking for our funds be more and more community centered, uh, but also responding to the needs of their community in a way that only they can. Every participating state has its own state advisory group. I sit on um, DC, I live in Washington DC, I sit on DC's state advisory group. And so decisions are being made locally about how to best utilize those federal dollars to solve local challenges and to come up with local solutions. So having that opportunity to have federal data, national perspective, others to talk to and learn from so you're not just making decisions in isolation, um, figuring out what are the best practices around the nation and spreading those um, creates opportunities to learn from others' mistakes, to share and celebrate other successes. I did get um, the vantage point of understanding what judges, attorneys, the probation office, a parent watch like community orgs, what is their positioning, understanding what are their recommendations um, in, in retrospect to mine. And so it was a great opportunity both in terms of um, like leadership development, but then also provided me a, a really cool niche saying, okay, great, it's awesome that we have all of these perspectives at the table. How can I act as a bridge uh, to kind of uh, sway more voices into the room um, that you, in terms of uh, young people uh, with lived experience, especially young people with lived experience. We are very much unified in our mission uh, for children to have incredible opportunities countrywide. Uh, but that, that's going to come through really, really localized solutions and that that accountability needs to happen at the local level and at the federal level, which is where the JDPA comes in as well. Reauthorization, uh, yeah, not only important, it, it's necessary. Our communities, all of our youth, all of our families, all of our systems thrive when our youth are thriving and they're invested in. Uh, this is how we tangibly show them that we believe in them, that we believe uh, that they are incredible, uh, and that we don't want to see them uh, end up in a carceral system or, or worse, that we want to provide them with the opportunities that, uh, that they deserve.